Welcome back to the channel, folks. This is Jason, host of Finding Words Financial. How's everything going today? Uh, let me know if my audio is working. Um, I have a little bit of trouble recently, but I am going to be looking at the market here kind of just as you folks are. And um, I haven't I've been on phone calls pretty much all day long. And let's take a look at what's going on in the market. I made that uh, kind of title and, and uh, thumbnail or well, not the thumbnail, but I made the title for the for the live stream today a little bit earlier, kind of knowing as soon as the uh, new data came out, kind of how market reaction was going to be. And some of you may be mystified. Manufacturing data actually looked really good. Uh, consumer data looks pretty good. Household balances look pretty good. So why is the market freaking out? Um, let, let's talk about that. Uh, any questions you guys have, let me know. And uh, let me see here just a moment what's going on on YouTube. It looks like things are a little slow. All right. So uh, open to questions today, but let's talk a little bit about the market. So Dow Jones is down 161 points, about half a percent. So yesterday it was down about a half a percent as well. So we're seeing a little slow bleed in the market right now. Um yeah, so we are seeing the Russell 2000 down about less than one tenth of one percent. The Nasdaq down uh, about 0.7 percent as well. So uh, tech stocks again bleeding a little bit. So uh, and I'll log into one of my programs here, guys. Hold on a second. But let me know what questions you guys have in the comments below. And I'd be happy to answer anything. Uh, you can ask me anything at all. Okay. Um, so yeah. So in terms of what's going on in the markets today and uh, thoughts on Upstart. Hey, Bob Johnson. Um, Upstart is a company that I've recently been acquiring. So it's a company that I had my eye on and when it dipped, so at $300 a share, it was way too rich for my blood. Uh, even looking at like you know, possible future earnings. At $150 a share when it dropped, I have to admit that it started looking seriously attractive. Um, even then, even then on like a five or 10 year basis when we're talking about growth. But when it, I really, really got serious when it hit about $75 a share, I was all prepared to buy in. Something else happened and I got delayed a little bit, which meant that my first purchase for Upstart was right, right around $26 a share. It was only like 10 shares. But that's kind of when I started acquiring. And uh, from there, it actually kind of grew. And now I'm close to uh, 100 shares at this point. So this is a new company for me that I've invested in. Fundamentals for uh, fundamentals for Upstart actually look really, really good. A couple of questions going ahead. You know, how well is... Um, is the AI actually working in terms in terms of uh, determining the credit quality of people involved in this market? That's kind of the thing that I'm really worried about. And how well is their portfolio going to stand uh, a test, right, when we go through a recession? And I do think that we are kind of in a recession right now, even though the market news that came out was really, really positive. And let's talk a little bit about that here in in, uh, in the near future. All right. Um, yeah. But thoughts on Upstart. I think Upstart's a fantastic investment. I think price point right now looks really attractive. And when you look at their growth, uh, it is just a growth story. There really is no other story other than growth when it comes to Upstart. And they've been profitable for years at this point. So, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely something to take a look at if you haven't taken a look at it. This is uh, what I wanted to talk about today. And uh, one of the, one, the, the the real news that I wanted to talk about here. So U.S. stocks gave it games Wednesday, Wednesday following stronger than expected readings from the U.S. manufacturing sector and stern comments from uh, J.P. Morgan boss Jamie Dimon. I don't, I don't care that much about what he has to say. But after the rally to start the trading session led by a 1% advance on the NASDAQ, all three major indexes turned negative about 80 minutes into the trading day. Uh, and this is the reason why is once this news was digested, it sounds good. Data from the Institute for Supply Management showed that U.S. manufacturing sector grew faster than expected in May. Another signal that fears of an imminent downturn in the economy may be overblown. So fears that a recession is overblown, then, then why the negative reaction in the stock market? 
Well, that's because the, the if the fears of a recession are overblown, it means the Fed is more likely to take action in terms of quantitative quantitative tightening, which I, I think that, um, and I, I kind of made this comment on my YouTube channel uh, earlier that I made it during, in the community section, that regardless of what happens in the economy, we need to get back to a normalized interest rate regimen and we need to have roll off on the balance sheet. We need to reduce the balance sheet of the Fed for the good of the long-term economy, right? For the long-term future of our economy and really the Western economy, we really need to be a bit more uh, responsible in that respect. So this news right here pretty much says that the economy is not as deter is not deteriorating as quickly as people had feared. Uh, the Fed may actually have to do more tightening to slow down the economy more. Uh, there's a couple of other things that came out recently. Um, supply chains are likely to start improving pretty rapidly as China has definitely targeted middle of June for opening up. There's going to be a mini boom over there. There's going to be a lot of things moving and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to start to see supply chain issues start to iron themselves out from here. I think that they may have just decided that, that uh, like basically the Chinese government may have just decided that COVID is over for them. Uh, yeah. But this is good news and good news is not necessarily everything that we want to hear right now. I made this point before the fed is completely willing to sacrifice the, the economy or sacrifice the stock market in order to kill the dragon that is inflation. Um, and that is certainly more important than equity values are equity values go up and they go down. Uh, people make money and they lose money in the stock market, but Inflation is a silent killer that gets everybody in the long run. Um, there are a few positive things about inflation. I made a video on someone else's concept uh, about um, uh, about inflation-induced debt destruction. That's one thing that's very positive about that. Uh, and, and, and if you didn't watch that video, take a look at it. It's basically saying that if you have fixed costs, like you own your own home, then being in an inflationary environment, if you're young enough and you're in the work, and you're in, and you're still in the workforce. It's not a terrible thing. You're going to get raises as time to go on. Your housing expenses are fixed, and it actually becomes cheaper and cheaper over time. And that helps your purchasing power keep up uh, with inflation as you change jobs and and get raises. Uh, some of the big news that came out today was the shocking announcement by Elon Musk that everybody needs to spend 40 hours in the office or look for another job. I, I foresee him backtracking on that statement here pretty soon. And um, the workforce, the labor force has simply changed. Uh, people have options now. And uh, that type of top-down directive and lack of flexibility. Now, look, there is something to be said about working in person. I just had a recent experience where I got together with uh, some of the people that I work with in the financial industry. And there is there is no substitute for the synergies you create when working together, there, there really is none. And you can do that a couple of days a week and still get that. You don't have to do it five days a week, but if you're saying that they have to be in the office for a minimum of 40 hours, I think that puts pressure probably on some of their top talent to go out and find another job. Um, some of those top ta top talents may be going to Lucid. They may be going to Rivian. They may be going to GM or Ford or someone else with a giant and growing EV program. So um, the, the EV workforce from the factory workers all the way up to the engineers is, is not disposable. All right. Uh, yeah. So that's one of my things. So let me see here. What Chinese EV company will start selling cars in the USA first? Um, you know, I, I really don't know which one that is. And, and, uh, I mean, there are a couple that do already, uh, like sh not Sherry auto, but, uh, there's, there's one crappy car company that, that started selling cars in the U S for as cheap as like $12,000, but they're really, really terrible vehicles. I just can't remember the name of it now. Uh, and they actually had a, they, there was a short scare with them, uh, last year where somebody, or two years ago when somebody published a short report. So no one will be the first, the first one's already here. Um, and I think Sherry Auto actually sells as well. It, it's Cherry and another company that actually sell as well. So if you're talking about like Lee, Xpeng, or Neo, it's probably uh, it, both Neo and Xpeng actually have offices here in in, in uh, California. Neo has an office in um, both Neo and Xpeng have offices in Silicon Valley, and Xpeng has an office down here in San Diego. I'm not sure exactly what they do here, and uh, yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk about other things going on and let me see here. 
Bob Johnson says, uh, they will all start selling in the U S you should follow Sandy Monroe. He says they're all coming. Yeah. They'll all start selling in the U S. Uh, it's going to be X one or Neo is going to be the first one though. The first big label coming over, or you could say BYD. They already sell, um, they already sell their electric buses here in the U S I think it's a matter of time before their cars come as well. Um, yeah, it actually may be BYD, maybe BYD that actually comes here first in volume. But Sandy Moreau is, of course, pretty much always correct. Uh, I, I don't know. That guy is so careful about what he says and so careful about his research that I think that he's like, if you, if you don't know who Sandy Monroe is, and I'm not sure that's actually the, the correct spelling of his last name, but he's an engineer who does a lot of uh, consulting for manufacturing, but he also does a lot of like re uh, reverse engineering of things that he just takes apart and looks at. And he's been one of my go-to sources for opinions on build quality for, uh, for different EVs and for different cars, uh, you know, period. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, he explains things exceptionally well. And if you don't know who he is, you should definitely check his, his stuff out. So, um, I don't know if he has a channel himself on, on YouTube. I just keep seeing his stuff out there. So just wanted to remind you guys that the super chat features are on if you feel so inclined and I am going to take a, uh, controversial question here so uh jason can you talk about biden's lack of relationship with saudi arabia and how a strong dollar may not abate and could impact bitcoin from going up so um biden does not have a lack of a relationship with saudi arabia biden has been in congress for 47 years he's had plenty of interactions with um the the the, you know, the saudi royal family and the saudi government it's just not a focus of his administration right now the strong dollar is an issue, though, and a lot of folks don't realize the strong dollar can actually hurt us in terms of inflation, as it in, in terms of a lot of things, as it makes imports very, very cheap and our exports more and more expensive. And in this inflationary environment, um, it, it it actually is a, a feedback loop that uh, is, is going to cause problems. So. Do you bring down inflation? And when you do that, it, it strengthens the dollar. And then when you do that, it creates this additional inflationary pressure. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's going to do that, but but it does. Uh, so it's there are amazing things. It, it is amazingly complex to talk about inflation and to talk about the petrodollar, talk about a strong dollar. Uh, but how does it impact Bitcoin from going up? So you should not consider Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. It's clearly not. You should not. You should consider Bitcoin at this point and all crypto at this point to be correlated to the stock market. Not 100%, but there's probably at least a 0.75 to 0.95 uh, you know, correlation to the stock market. And uh, I think that's if you're looking at it as an investment rather than a speculation, that's kind of how I would look at it. But also, what does limited supply when it can be infinitely fractionalized, what does limited supply really say about tokenomics, right? Just because you're limited to 21 billion coins or whatever the limit is for uh, for Bitcoin, uh, if you can infinitely fractionalize it, then then why is it an inflation hedge? Why do you have deflationary pressures? Now, there are other reasons, of course, to believe that there are deflationary pressures, but None of the sort of economic ecosystem that was predicted when Bitcoin first came out has really come to be at this point for a couple of different reasons. I don't think anyone expected the uh, profusion of uh, uh, of pretenders that came out there right after Bitcoin. There are over 18,435 different uh, cryptocurrencies and, and a thousand different blockchains. I checked just two days ago, two days ago making a video. Um, so I think that's disrupted the ecosystem a little bit. And I think that's going to change here in the future. I, I have a video actually coming out on this on Friday where I talk about um, the multi -bit, or a multi blockchain future and how I don't really think that is as likely as people think. And I should have largely because of my experience in the technology industry. The technology industry loves standards. Um, so I think that, yeah, you'll see that video on Friday. So BYD has an office in Silicon Valley too. It's at Cupertino and Main Street. Uh, yeah, so BYD also has factory uh, like uh, uh, manufacturing facilities here. And um, yeah, so and I didn't see the uh, Xpeng office over at Mount Mountain View. I've actually driven by the Xpeng office here in San Diego and taken a picture of it. But what's really weird is I couldn't get anyone to tell me what exactly they do there. 
Uh, and that's, that's what, but if I, I, I kind of have a general idea though, if I'm looking around uh, at what's going on here. So um, yeah, let's talk, let's take another question that may or a comment that may be uh, controversial. Powell couldn't raise rates last year since higher rate increased the value of the dollar. Germany and other countries still have negative rates. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the timeline of that, but I think that me that is partially correct and partially incorrect. It looks like it looks like central banks around the world started tightening uh, a lot sooner than we did. So I'm not sure they still had negative rates back last year. Uh, I, I think that the idea that inflation was transitory and really tied to supply shock. I still think it's supplied uh, tied to supply shock. It just may not be transitory, uh, especially considering continued shocks with continued lockdowns in China and, you know, the uh, warfare war going on in Ukraine right now, which by the way, the war in Ukraine, if you haven't thought about it this way, and most people aren't, I realize that uh, it is proving to be a real proving ground for two different types of EV technologies. Number one, the e-bike uh, and number two, uh, e you know, EV uh, drones. It, it's absolutely, and I, I may be changing my opinion on the commercial value of EV drones going forward uh, for at least in, in terms of delivery. And I think that the proving ground that is going through right now in Ukraine, where it's delivering munitions in very challenging conditions, I think that that is a, uh, that is something that, that these delivery companies like Amazon and USPS and UPS and all that, they are going to glean a lot of information from this. And it's a very cynical way of looking at what's going on in the war right now. But war always changes the economy going forward. Many technologies were derived because of or in military um, in, in military research and made it out to the public. And drones are one of those things where they didn't necessarily uh, – military applications are some of the first things um, that they had that, that, that made them commercially viable – but I think that this is another one of those cases, like you know, Tang coming on the NASA program, like uh, uh, like I, I just can't think of any other examples off the top of my head right now. But there are a number of different things that are coming out of this that are really sort of solidifying that that these uh, EVs can operate in in almost all conditions. So yeah, and let's see. Bob Johnson says, don't forget many car brands that, that previously aren't Chinese are now Chinese, like EG Volvo. Um, yeah, you know, you know what's funny is I'm actually kind of surprised that um, a larger manufacturer in China that's gone pretty heavy into EVs, somebody like Geely, hasn't made a move here in the US. Now, I, I do remember going to an auto show. It was like back in the year 2000 or something and seeing some of the the the, the Chinese companies that brought their vehicles there and, and getting inside of the, a Geely. And man, it uh, it reminded me of some of the East German and Russian cars that I drew, drove in Europe where I was a bit heavier than the average European at the time. And I could feel the frame sag in the car when I sat down. And number one, it made me feel enormously fat. Uh, but number two, it was just a cheap vehicle. And some of these show vehicles that they brought over had rust on the interior of their, their steel panels. So, uh, yeah, so uh, build quality has got to improve in order for them to to do really well here in the U.S. From what I understand, Xpeng and Neo's build quality is really, is really second only to like VW or, or German manufacturers. It's on the same level as, as, a, as a Tesla right now uh, in terms of build quality. It's on the same level as, as, as well. Ford and GM have better build quality than, than Tesla does in some respects. We see. We get another question here from Patrick Mulligan. Um, do you think in this environment that uh, Broadcom is paying too much for VMware? So I haven't looked at that deal in particular. I, I do know that you could probably discount every single deal going on there right now uh, in terms of uh, in terms of its its future value, and that has the discount would have everything to do with calculating calculating in that equity risk premium meaning the difference between what they're borrowing the money what was essentially on a risk free basis 6 months ago uh on an interest free basis 6 months ago and then buying you know an equity uh, or buying a broad a broad account for this now they're going to be paying a higher amount of interest on that going into an era where um where where future revenues may be discounted so yeah i think every deal right now if you committed to a dollar amount more than 2 months ago I think that you are, um, yeah, 
I think that you're 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 correct that they're paying too much for it, but not because VMware is necessarily like I said. I don't know that much about this deal. Not because it, it that by itself is not worth that. It's just the environment. Uh, Bob Johnson also says Geely is opening sales offices and malls here in Seattle area too. Excellent. I did not know that. Um, I did not know that. And I've been following Geely for a while. I just haven't looked at any current news for them in the last month or so. So I think that's very interesting. So they have, um, so what Canoe is trying to do and what a couple of other con- co- or companies are trying to do in the EV space is basically create a modularized uh, vehicle platform for other companies to develop. I think, so Geely has what's called the, the SEA or the C program and it's basically the skateboard and um uh elon's ozolin says i can't delete my comment i didn't see your comment buddy so um yeah if it was uh if it had a email if i had a um uh you know a, a web address in it or curse words or something on it it probably got deleted all on its own um so oh bob Johnson says it's the pole star division uh that they're opening oh okay all right that makes a lot more sense um so is it Hertz that's already committed to buying, uh, you know, like like 800 pole stars or something for their fleet? I think it's Hertz. Uh, you know, right after they committed to buying a bunch of uh, Teslas, they committed to buying a bunch of pole stars too, which I kind of found confusing on that because that platform definitely doesn't have um, as many as many uh, adherents. It doesn't have as much testing. So, but Geely's uh, platform, which I call the C platform, it's basically a skateboard and, uh, you know, basically drive, well, not drivetrain, but the motors on, on wheel hubs. And they want to provide this to EV companies kind of as the backbone. They want to essentially produce the motors and the battery technology for the EV industry for all of these different startups. And so they could, you could modularize and build on top of that in some ways that may be the future of the EV industry is that, we end up maybe with one or two companies having their own brands. Uh, but then we have a bunch of other companies that do like special, especially de- designed vehicles using a, one of a couple of platforms. It could be Canoe's platform. It could be Geely's platform. Uh, there's an Israeli company out there that's making a platform too, where they're just selling essentially the skateboard to design companies. And then they, you, they design the software, the uh, you know, the frame, the shell on top of it. And we may have an era of sort of wild vehicle diversification, which I think would be interesting. Um, when you look at the vehicle industry and they always talk about how the the person, the vehicle that you drive is an expression of your personality. Well, my, my personality must be cheap bastard then because I, I don't drive anything that isn't used several years old and discounted by, you know, 60 to 80%. Uh, because I just, I don't see the point in spending a lot of money on a car. I want to go from point A to point B. But if you think about it, um, for many, many years, how could uh, your vehicle be an expression of your personality when you really had such a limited choice, right? Uh, before the, the introduction of Japanese vehicles here, you essentially had Ford, Chrysler, and GM. And I, I don't know what those choices of vehicles would say about your personality. Uh, and I think that's been, I think it's kind of an overblown tendency that's affected the, uh, the the vehicle industry for a very, very long time. I see us entering into a new era of choice, not necessarily with the major vehicle manufacturers like Tesla, GM, and Ford, but possibly with smaller shops offering custom, uh, you know, custom electric vehicles. I actually see that if this idea of producing a platform is successful, and I really think that the, the Canoe is one of the companies that that could, in fact, they were working with Hyundai on this, but I, know, I don't know what that relationship looks like right now. Uh, and I don't know that they're going to be able to stay in business either. Um, but Geely definitely will. They're they're a large company. They produce 1.7. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Eric, I'll get to your question in a second. Uh, but Geely produces about 1.7, 1. 1.4 to 1.7 million vehicles per year already. They're one of the larger producers of vehicles in China because that market is hopelessly fractured, right? You don't have anyone other than VM that or, or VW that dominates market share. And when I say dominates market share, like VW is far and away the, the best seller there at this point. Um, let me see here. Uh, this is Eric M. So what do you think of Kathy's 30 to 50% GDP yearly growth prediction from artificial general uh, intelligence? So I need time to digest that. 
um, there are some other research. There's some other research I was reading recently on um, sort of Web three and the metaverse, where they're saying that this is a 13 trillion dollar opportunity. Let me put that in perspective for you. 13 trillion dollars is a little bit more than half of United States's current GDP. That's assuming that essentially all of digital or, or all of our digital economy right now moves into the metaverse, where we're interacting with it in like an AR and VR. And assuming that it grows by, I don't know, 25, 30%. Um, so that's a huge assumption. And that, but the, the, the research that I looked at was not the only research that came up with a substantially similar number. And they were all between eight trillion and thirteen trillion dollars in opportunity. Some of this is going to be driven by uh artificial intelligence. Now, what does she mean by artificial general intelligence? I'm not really sure. But we're already seeing impacts in artificial intelligence, particularly with drug discovery. Um, it has shortened the time for uh, to, to get products to testing stage, and it has eliminated products that weren't going to work at an earlier stage. So you're not investing tons of money. Like if you look at drug discovery, it's very expensive. It takes a very long time, and 90% of your ideas fail, right? And that's what makes it so expensive. Uh, artificial intelligence is already already dramatically lowering the cost of drug discovery, and it's already dramatically lowering the cost of individualized uh, genetic treatments as well. Uh, and, and this is this is the real future that she's probably talking about is where we're, as we're we're seeing this rapid expansion of, of artificial intelligence figuring out ways to make our lives less expensive. So what are we going to do? with those savings from that company, what are they going to do with those savings from drug discovery that, you know, it used to be that 90% of these, let's say they just dropped the level to 50% of products failing or 50% of drugs failing instead of 90%. Well, that frees up a massive amount of cash that would literally just have been wasted. Right. So entirely wasted uh, on, on something that, that had, that was essentially a dead end. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I buy 30 to 50% yearly growth, I, I do grow. I, I do think that uh, yearly growth could be. That's unrealistic. Thirty to fifty percent yearly growth is just unrealistic. So normal GDP growth that everyone is happy with, meaning the public is happy with it, the Fed is happy with happy with it, our our trading partners are happy with it. Everyone's happy with three percent growth. You get into the sustained GDP growth of four point eight percent or so, and and that kind of overheats the economy. We would not have a. Uh, we we don't have a monetary policy that could deal with 30 to 50 percent sustained yearly gdp growth so i don't know if that was maybe i hope that's a misquote i really do but yeah let me see here kathy is kind of making some really bad short-term moves like dumping spotify which she should never have bought but her agi bet is on uh, nvidia and tesla yeah, I, I don't have any comment on the Spotify thing. That's actually not something that I would have bought either. Um, I think that the music industry in general is just kind of in trouble. Um, they are finding it very, very hard to find their way forward in this new world. Uh, musicians have never really been treated that well by uh, by the music industry. And it has not improved with technology. And I think that there's a revolt coming, some sort of tech revolt coming at some point. And Spotify is not the company to lead that. Uh, they, they've largely been taking advantage of musicians as well. So, uh, but in terms of NVIDIA and Tesla, um, I, I think Tesla is still a good growth story and a good uh, bet. But I think that NVIDIA is a better bet for the next decade. Uh, I have a, I, th I think it's next Monday. I have a video coming out uh, on NVIDIA where I cover one tiny slice of what they are doing in the medical field. Um, this new suite of products that they have out where uh, they're essentially, uh, they're, they're basically changing the way that you handle data in the hospital. They're creating smart hospitals. They're aggregating data from instruments and using artificial intelligence to streamline things and lower costs. Um, this is one tiny slice of what N NVIDIA does. And then there's the NVIDIA Omniverse and its manufacturing capabilities, its capabilities with drug discovery. Be well beyond just gaming and virtual worlds, uh, it's modeling for industry and medicine that is really going to be the application for Omniverse. So I don't care if you don't like any of the games produced in Omniverse, 
that's not going to be where the vast majority, I, well, I don't know, but it could be where the vast majority of money comes from, but a lot of money is going to come from industrials, materials, uh, communications, healthcare, financials. They have this whole suite of financial uh, software that I, have, I haven't gotten access to it yet, but I'm looking to get access to it. I don't want to try it out, but this company is doing so much. It's uh, living up to the promise that we thought that Tesla would, but they're not talking about what they're doing. They're just doing. Okay. Um, so what, one of the things that kind of, that kind of upsets me with Tesla is the predictions of, of self of, of true self-driving, right? We, we don't really have that at this point. I don't know how far away we are from it. We keep hearing later on this year, later on this year, later on this year. Um, all of these things are being tried by NVIDIA. They're being attempted by NVIDIA. There's billions of dollars being invested by NVIDIA, uh, but you're not hearing about it. They're not really going full bore on it. Like the, the, the things that they're doing in the medical industry is probably one of the worst publicized uh, missions that I've ever heard of. In, in a company and they've committed billions of dollars to this and they're already doing hundreds of millions of dollars of business in this air, area. So, um, yeah. So Edward Gilmartin says German interest rates were negative until January of 2022. Yeah. Like I said, I haven't really kept up with that. Um, I do know that tightening started worldwide, um, a little bit earlier than that, but uh, German interest rates would have been in line with the, the ECB though. So that would, that would have been all of Europe somewhat, uh, pretty much. And sadly enough, Europe's economy right before the Ukraine war started was finally looking good. We finally had like real growth in small cap sector. We really finally had real growth above inflation and it, things were really starting to move and look well right before um, COVID started. And then again, we started to see some recovery right before the uh, Ukrainian in, uh, invasion. And it's so disappointed that they have been beaten up so long, almost 14 years now, their economy has been beaten up. So, yeah. Uh, here we go. What do you think about NVIDIA eating uh, Unity's launch or a better acquiring entity? Uh, I think it's too early to say anything about that. Like, I, I own 300 Unity shares, um, and I own a little less than that in NVIDIA, but I'm I'm – actively acquiring nvidia and i'm not actively acquiring any more unity at this point um it's not that i have anything bad to say about unity their their business model is, is really uh different than like a roblox or something like that and the focus of their business is different uh so i don't know that they're going to eat the lunch because gaming is yeah so the metaverse concept i don't know how much that's going to consolidate like i don't know how many metaverses we're going to end up with but it just like everything in tech would probably end up with one really large metaverse and, and several far less important, smaller ones. Um, and Unity's may be one of those far less important, smaller ones, or it may be that they are able to marshal the best people in video game writing and they end up dominating the field. But right now it's a real, it's a, it's a two man race right now in the gaming space between Epic games and unity and Epic games is owned something like 40% by Tencent. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that it's, it's very interesting that, uh, that, that you're already seeing Nvidia looking at unity as a takeover option. Uh, that is something that I considered before too. I just think it's a little bit early to say that. Although, man, with the way the price has dropped right now, it'd be the perfect opportunity. All right, Eric M says said two years ago that the price of oil would go to eighteen dollars, which is below the cost of production. Uh, it uh, okay. So, oil is a global market, but oil production costs, depending on the oil that's coming out of the ground are far different than $18 uh, per barrel. Uh, I, I think that I want to say that the last time I did a study on Saudi oil, I think they were profitable, at, like north of $8. They're profitable. Uh, in the United States, you have a hard time being profitable at under $70 per barrel when it comes to most producers. So the, that number is wildly different. If you go to Venezuela, it, 10 years ago, it was about $55 per gallon or per barrel. Uh, that made Venezuelan oil profitable. It may be different today. I don't know that. So, but basically at $50 a barrel or so, uh, 10, 20 years ago, Venezuela was really Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia was not right. Uh, lower than at under $50 a barrel. You can't 
there's a lot of countries that are pushed out of being profitable. So, but two years ago, uh, that would have been right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, if it was two years and two months ago, that would have been, been about correct. The price of oil in terms of oil futures actually went negative for a little bit, which sounded pretty crazy. But for more than a week or so, um, that the price of oil was was well below thirty five dollars a barrel, uh, and, and that was that was amazing. It was about a, it was about a week or so, and then it kind of bounced back pretty quickly. But the price of oil was artificially depressed for uh, more than a year because of, of of demand. Demand here in the U.S. dried up. And people stopped pumping or here in the U.S. Like prior, just prior to COVID, I think we were uh, pumping maybe about uh, about 13 million barrels of oil per day. I think that may have been top production here in the U.S. About 13 million barrels per oil a day. We're using about 9.1 uh, million barrels of uh, or, uh, gasoline per day, which is not oil. Gasoline is not oil. Um, so the, the whole concept of oil independence is actually a complex calculation that doesn't have as much to do with driving as you think. And it didn't mean that we weren't importing oil. It means that we were a net oil exporter because we were exporting a bunch of petroleum products like plastics and things like that. So, uh, and, and chemicals, it's a very different statement than just saying that we could produce all of, we have never been able to produce not once, uh, since like 1968, have we produced enough gasoline to, uh, meet all of our needs. We haven't produced enough oil to produce all of the gasoline to meet all of our needs. Not a single time since the late 1960s have we done that. So, um, if you read up on what oil independence actually means, Hey Rune, uh, we actually covered quite a bit about go EV, um, here earlier about canoe and, uh, talking about their platform, uh, type of technology versus, uh, Geely's platform type type of technology and how I see that there could be sort of a new era of auto customization. Uh, and you can go back and look at that. So, uh, Kathy acted like a teenage girl. She never saw a stock bubble before. Um, I, I, I don't know you that you should judge, anyone's uh, performance as a money manager by a single year of performance. Uh, so if you look at the previous seven years before that, she was one of the top performing money managers out there. And it's not just that she had a bad year. She, you know, she's in a volatile sector. She's hundred percent tech invested. You know that she's going to be more uh, volatile and than the rest of the market. And when the market goes down, she's going to lose more than the market. When the market goes up, she's going to make more than the market. Uh, that is the nature of her fund. That is the nature of the type of thematic investing that she's doing. And that's the nature of investing in a technological revolution or multiple technological revolutions. Um, so we're going to see this again. When the market goes up, she's going to trounce everyone. Uh, when the market goes down, everyone's going to call her crazy Kathy again uh, because that's what they do. She actually, I've not been a fan of the short-term trading that she's doing lately, but remember, uh, she has a imperative that you and I don't have, meaning that she needs to produce some sort of return and justify the fees that she's charging on the accounts in order to do that. And that's the pressure that all ETF and mutual fund managers face. Right. Um, and, and that may be sort of the motivation. There's also redemptions for the fund and, and, uh, and, and purchases of the fund mean, meaning that she has to make some of these moves. If you have giant redemptions of the fund, you have to sell out some of your stocks to free up that cash. And when, fun, when money moves back in, you've got to make some purchases. So a lot of times you have this imperative to trade $40 million today because th that's what was redeemed. Or uh, or so the, the calculation for creating, I don't actually understand entirely the calculation for creating new shares for an ETF or uh, or creating new uh, or, or, or getting rid of shares. So I haven't, I haven't researched that in a while. So yeah, uh, let me see here. Patrick Mulligan says, any views on Elon's message? Yeah, we, we covered this a little bit. Uh, I, I think it could backfire pretty handily, largely because it's not a good working environment to begin with. It, these engineers are, are talented people that have options to go elsewhere. Um, and and it's, they may not, and you may not necessarily see them go to companies uh, like Lucid or, or, or to GM or something like that. They may have... Uh, they, there's a lot of different places these these people could go. I mean, they, they could go to fields that are completely unrelated. But even the factory personnel, the factory personnel do pretty well in these places. They're making upwards of $100,000 a year. They have a nice bonus structure and they all get stock options as well. Uh, one of the things that concerns me 
is that Chinese workers working in factories who are now working a single closed looped shift in, in the uh, Shanghai plant, um, they have a bonus structure. They don't get stock in Tesla, um, which I'm, I'm a little concerned that they're being treated unfairly in comparison to American workers. And the reason why, um, yeah, I just find that to be concerning. Why, why should a worker in China not have, I understand why you pay them less in terms of salary, but why don't they have the same chance or a similar chance for wealth generation? Yeah, they have. Um, yeah. So in the, so it, it, like if you go to, to China, of course, that's a great job. There's plenty of demand for it. And these people are being worked almost to death, right? Here in the U S it, it, it's, it's a, it's a work situation where, where they have issues with their workforce already and telling these highly educated, really in demand technical workers come back to the office or quit. Yeah. I think that could backfire. Uh, I, I think it does. I, I do have a tendency to want to stay home and work from my house all the time too, but you, you can't replace the synergies you get from working in a creative space with a bunch of other people, but he wants them to be there 40 hours a week because it's not fair to the factory workers. It's okay. And he's telling people you can pretend to work, uh, you know, somewhere else. I get a lot more work done at home than I did in the office. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, when I say a lot more, it's tons more. I'm running several businesses from my home. I have time to do this YouTube channel. Um, and I have time to research all kinds of stuff that I want to research largely because the way I work is just in spurts. It's at random hours. You know, I work early in the morning from like four in the morning to like, uh, like seven or so. And then I'll work again from 10 to whatever. I'll sleep a little bit in the middle of the day. Um, I only sometimes in the middle of the day, I wake up for my meetings to go for, or go for walks, but I, I, I can't operate on a nine to five schedule, 40 days, 40 hours a week anymore. I, it's not something I want to do. And millions of people, mil, tens of millions of people have figured out they can do just as good of a job at home. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, so I think it's, there's a solid chance that's going to backfire. He's going to lose some of his best employees to other companies. He may end up losing some of the best employees to companies that will, uh, yeah, that will compete with it. So Goldman forecasts a sharp correction for lithium, expecting prices to average around fifty-four thousand dollars a ton in 2022, before rolling over to just US sixteen thousand in 2023. Interesting. I'd need to see that. Uh, and so right now, um, the I think they might be right that it's going to crash, but a sharp correction really has to do with more production coming online. Um, right now, they just aren't on the people digging exploring processing and, and all that. And so that entire industry has to be built out in the next three or four years in order to satisfy demand. So there's going to be far more demand for lithium for several years than there is supply. Uh, we're going to have problems with the lithium supply chain for a very long time until we get massive uh, investment in this entire supply chain. It's one of the reasons why I suggest you, you invest broadly in, uh, in a mutual fund or ETF when it comes to the lithium uh, supply chain. But yeah, I, I think that's probably fairly accurate, but it has more to do with the entire production capacity of the industry rather than lithium being overvalued. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, you said that, never mind, in the next comment. So long term demand for lithium expect to remain strong with a potential for bull market from 2024 as prices bottom and supply normalizes. Yep. So, Dominic Auerbach, I know a number of Auerbachs. Um, hey, how's it going, Dominic? So, Arc founded in 2014 has beaten the market three out of seven years, up 45 cents in four years, not sold on Arc. Um, yeah, I, largely, I'm not sold on Arc either as an, uh, as an investment. I hold like 100 shares of Arc K and I hold Arc G largely because um, it, largely because you, you don't have very few individuals. In fact, I'd say no individual really has the expertise. If you're not a geneticist to look at um, a, a company in genomics and say this technology is going to win, I don't think that you can do that. And I proved that last year when I was looking at BioNano and there's a video that I never released because I couldn't get the uh, the uh, actual scientist that I spoke with to, to come on the video with me. But she was talking about how all the videos that I was looking at were basically BS that none of them actually, um, the technology didn't work the way it was described on the internet and it wasn't ground shaking or really impressive in any dimension. So yeah, that, uh, yeah. Um, 
so they have an also Edward, they have a number of funds. So which, which one are you comparing it to and which is, which market are you comparing it to? So I, cause ARC uh, invest over that time period from 2014 to 2020 uh, was essentially the second best performing mutual or mutual fund family on the entire planet at that time. And I remember seeing like several articles on that. I can't remember the company that beat them. Somebody listening here probably knows the company that beat them, but there was one. Um, let me see here. That is capitalism, exploiting poor people who don't have human rights. A shirt sells for $8. It is capitalism, uh, which is odd, odd uh, because it's in China, uh, which we all know is not really communist. It's state capitalism. Um, oh my God. I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get emails or nasty comments from somebody in uh, in China because of this, but yes, uh, it it is capitalism. We live in a capitalist system. We can figure out how to navigate a capitalist system, or we can complain about it. Um, not not that we shouldn't complain about it. At times, we should. Um, but I hope all of you are watching this broadcast and, and learning a couple of things about the nature of capitalism and communism. If you live in a capitalist society. The idea that you're lower class or middle class or upper class or, or or upper middle class or lower middle class, none of those distinctions are actually real. There's only capitalist and proletariat. There's urban proletariat. There's uh, you know there, there's rural proletariat. However you want to say it, but there's people that own the means of production and people that don't. And as long as you don't own the means of production, then you are at the mercy of people that do. And I hope if you're watching this channel that you are hoping to acquire enough assets to live off of your assets. That's literally what being a capitalist uh, is, is I don't make money by working, although I do work. I make money by ownership of assets that produce income while I do nothing. That is that is who capitalists are. Um, when you look at somebody who like runs a shop or something or a small business, those people are what's called a, a, a separate class and they're called petit bourgeoisie. They're considered little capitalists, right? Um, but yeah, so... Learning about that distinction. If you've never read Marx, it doesn't turn you into a Marxist, but it can give you a better understanding of how capitalism works to get you to work for it, to get you to willingly be a cog in the machine. And it's very hard to free yourself from the machine once you've got started down the path of a career or something like that. Uh, and the whole idea of career, I think, needs to be rethought if you're looking to break the chains here, get off the hamster wheel. You need to rethink the idea of career. All you need to do is produce that first real excess and take that excess. I mean, I mean, in terms of income, in terms of money and take that money and start investing. And really you don't have an excuse in today's economy. You can invest in fractional shares. You can do uh, fractional properties. There are all kinds of companies now that do like tenants in common uh, investments through, you know, electronically or REITs and things like that. You can start making a small amount of money work for you. It used to be that you had to buy a hundred shares of something. Who could afford to buy a hundred shares of a stock today? A lot of people couldn't do that back then. Today, you can start with nothing and start investing. And I, I think this is a, it's, it's never been harder to fall off the bandwagon in terms of a, a, a sort of terms of a safety net here in the U S uh, but it's also never been easier to really break the chains of, uh, of being in the working class. So, yeah, let me see here. Um, uh, Hey Jason, what will be your five year view of crypto in terms of regulation? It seems that stablecoin failures have hurt the technology. So the reality is with stablecoin, uh, I'm going to leave this up here. The reality is with stable coin. And look, I had this experience, um, back when, uh, back when the Euro came around. So I, I've lived in a couple of different countries and I got used to dealing with converting dollars to Belgian francs, converting dollars to French francs. Um, converting things to euros was easier for me because there was price parity. Uh, it was rel it was close enough. Right? I could just close enough for, for government work when it first started. But I remember my friends in France and in Belgium had the hardest time, the older folks who were a little bit older than me, had the toughest time thinking about euros in terms of euros. They, there was no relative way of thinking of this. And, and, and this is the thing, stable coin in the future may not exist. The reason that it exists right now is people want to do business in the dollar because that's how they form a reference, right? But you don't have people now that live in Belgium who still think of euros in terms of how many old Belgian francs they were worth, right? Roughly 36 francs to the dollar. It just took time for that adjust to, to adjust. And 
I also think that out of the 18,435 cryptocurrencies that existed yesterday, um, when I did my research, that roughly four or five, five of them will be significant in the next five years. The rest of them are going to fail miserably. Um, and largely because there's no, there's no difference between them at all. Zero. They're just crass attempts to uh, generate money. They uh, contribute nothing to uh, the ecosystem, nothing to decentralized finance. Um, but I think that stablecoin will eventually sort of disappear. Right now it exists because people can't mentally make that jump between what is crypto worth in terms of value. They have to think of it in terms of what is it worth in terms of a dollar. But yeah, um, I, I think that regulation first would come to uh, stable coins. I mean, they would have rules just like they have rules around money market funds and how you maintain a, a, a stable dollar peg. You're going to have pretty strict rules here coming up, which that's not terrible for the industry. I, I said that I don't like regulation in terms of crypto, but I need to backtrack on that and say that regulation of stable coin is not the most terrible idea that I've ever heard, uh, largely because it just provides stability for the market. And that's all I really want is asset stability or, or is, is asset price stability for stable coin. So, yeah. Uh, let me see here. China offered Elon Musk land for free to combat Trump and the trade war. That's why his earnings has been so good. And China can get all this technology from thousands of workers. around. Well, I do agree that China was so accommodating to him so they can get technology for free from thousands of workers, but he, he's also doing a very good job of developing technology and products specifically. Well, he, He's trying to do a very good job of de developing tele uh, technology and products that are specifically designed for a Chinese market, right? Not every vehicle that works here in the U.S. is going to work for China. They have they have quite a different need need. So, uh, but to combat Trump, that that's not true at all. The uh, the planning for Giga Shanghai started a long time ago, um, way longer than than Donald Trump was even seen as a candidate, way before 2015. So, uh, the plans for this were almost from the very, very beginning, at least in 2009, 2010 was the first time I heard about eventually expanding to China. Uh, it may have even been sooner than that. I don't know, but I don't think it had much to do with politics whatsoever. Uh, I do think that the, the, it's just access to the largest car that was already the largest car market, uh, available on the entire planet. So, um, BRQS and, uh, XELA. So, uh, well, I don't know too much about these stocks. So let's take a little look here about BRQ. Yes. And I'll be, I'll, I'll warn you right away that if it's a penny stock, then I probably don't know too much about it. Um, there are a lot of trading rules and rules regarding, uh, yeah, there's a ton of rules regarding the content that I can really talk about freely on my channel because I am a licensed financial uh, you know, advisor. Um, and I really couldn't talk about penny stocks like this, the market on this. It, well, the volume is huge on this. Um, yeah, the volume is absolutely, absolutely massive on this. See beta monthly. Yeah. I don't know a ton about this company at all, but at this price point, it's hard for me to talk about them. So, and then what was the other one? EXLA technologies. So Borg Technologies is a strategic partnership to develop next generation smart control products for solar companies. Interesting. Um, there's some other, and this is another company in the same industry. Is that what we're looking at here? Once again, uh, penny stock, kind of hard for me to take a look at that. If I'm looking at some of these 52 week range, anywhere from $5 and 45 cents down to 21 cents. It's a company with declining revenues year after year here. I think that's kind of what people are looking at. Um, so negative earnings per share. It's been losing money for a while. Doesn't, this has tons of volume as well. Like 18 million shares changing hands per day. Um, so I don't know what's going on there, but it's had declining revenues since 2008. That is not a, or 2018, not a good sign. Uh, especially when you're looking at it close to, to close to 40% less in the way of revenues since 2018. Uh, losses are narrowing a little bit, so that's not terrible. Missed earnings in the last three quarters. Um, what are they doing here? So they don't have a lot of analyst coverage either, which is not terrible. Um, 
but yeah, so enterprise information and document management, digital processes. Yeah, I don't know a ton about these company about this company or the other one. Uh, I will say that in terms of ex excellent technologies, the fact that they've been losing money for years, and um, yeah, billion in revenue trading at point two. <sighs> yeah, but they have they've got declining revenues for the last four years. That's my main concern. Um, declining revenues one year and then the next year it improves. I'm okay with that. Maybe two years in a row. Um, but even a company like Twitter, uh, where they haven't made any money for the last two years and we've seen declining, I, I think I remember it was declining revenues. This is another company when I go back to Bork, um, declining revenues since 2018 to be expected for in, in, in 2020. Um, but yeah, man, they got crushed. They went from a $120 million down to 40 million in, uh, in, in revenues. They've got widening losses this year. Um, at 17 cents a share, you can buy a lot for a little though. Um, you can, you can buy a lot for a little at $17 a share and it's a giant risk in terms of investment. Let's say this is worth $17 a share, right? And I was looking at buying a thousand shares. I probably wouldn't do it. Um, I, I need to see demonstration that they can grow revenues at some point. And, um, yeah, so yeah, I, I just don't know enough about when you say BRQS has, BRQS has uh, 5G Qual Qualcomm licensing. What is being uh, licensed, like 5, uh, 5G licensing? You're talking about a chipset? Are you talking about uh, something like frequency modulation equipment? Are you talking about it? it just I, You have to be a little bit more clear about what you're talking about here. So that's, um, and or I would have to do my research on this. Sorry about that. If you guys could hear that music coming through, that was an advertisement through there. So market down 176 by the bell. Uh, the Dow was down 176. SP down 30, uh, 0.92. Nasdaq down 86. So guys, uh, two days in a row, the market is down a little bit. It's been a slow bleed. And um, yeah, so the... Uh, uh, yeah, so small business optimistic despite inflation and labor struggles. And that largely has to do with the credit markets. I was looking into not this particular video, but another article that was kind of titled the same way um, recently. And it's largely because the credit environment for uh, small businesses has improved in that uh, interest rates have gone up, but lending requirements have been loosened a little bit. So uh, I think that's why that small businesses are still relatively optimistic. So I'm uh, I, I'm not optimistic. I'm optimistic that we're not heading towards a a catastrophic economic disaster like 2008 almost was. I think we're at the natural end of a credit cycle, and that we'll see mild slowing of the economy. We'll see uh, a tightening. We're gonna we're, I, we want normalized interest normalized interest rate environment. We want the Fed to have a balance sheet roll off, and uh, we we don't want this hanging over our economy. We don't want to have you know a hundred percent of GDP in debt either. Like I I prefer having less. Like, countries operate with more. Like Japan has I think one hundred and sixty percent of GDP um, in, in terms of debt. The problem with them is they have a declining population and uh, not a lot of young people. They're just not, not having enough kids. So, uh, yeah. But um, I think one of the big things, if you guys, did you guys see SoFi stock today? SoFi stock was down and that's because uh, Biden has sent a, um, a, a proposal to Congress to forgive $10,000 of student debt. Um, so as a matter of, as a matter of principle, uh, I've actually been really in favor of, and I'm talking economic principle, I've been really in favor of Biden um, just forgiving most student debt. I think it should be limited to people who make under a certain amount of money. I, I think the, the, the limit is 100, or 125,000. I think whatever the limit is, make it arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. Let's not give the reward to the highest earning people in the United States. Let's give it the reward to the millions upon millions of people that own a portion of that $1.7 trillion in debt who don't actually have a college degree, despite the fact that they took on all this debt, they still don't have that degree. They may never have that degree. Maybe they had a kid or something. Maybe college just wasn't bad. Now they have this debt that they can't discharge easily through bankruptcy court. Going to, A lot of this is going to public universities that should have been supported by tax dollars, but states have paid a smaller and smaller and smaller portion of the necessary funding needed to fund universities ever since the 1980s. And they push that burden more and more off onto uh, individuals. And 
I don't think that's right for our society. I want to live in a society where people are educated. I don't want to live near a bunch of ignorant people. Um, and I think that we need to make the necessary investments in, in educating our young people to do that. And that involves sending them to university and making it eminently reasonable. You know, it used to be that I could work when I went to university and I'm old enough to where university basically costs like, like 12 bucks, four potatoes, you know, and a sack of grain. I mean, that's how old I am. I literally could wait tables in the wintertime, two or three nights a week, and I could work at a refinery or on on a supply boat time or fishing boat in the summertime. And I could make all the money that I needed, not just to pay for my tuition and my books, but also to pay most of my living expenses through the year where I only worked a couple of days a week as a waiter when I was actually in school. Those days are over. You couldn't, you can't go to, um, you, there's almost no university in the con country you can go to with a minimum wage job. And I got paid minimum wage. Most of the time I was a terrible waiter, terrible, terrible. It was the worst waiter you could think of. Um, surly, just bad attitude, uh, extremely forgetful. Um, yeah, terrible. But um, hold on a second. Um, the uh, but yeah. So I want to live in a society where we have an educated population, and ninety two percent of student debt who who owns it? It's owned by the federal government. That's who it's owned by. So right now we have one point seven trillion dollars owned to the federal government by some by people by sixty percent of these people don't even have degrees, so they didn't really benefit from taking out all of these dollars and it would be uh it would actually be pretty bad for inflation if we if we if we did this but it would be very good for the economy as a whole as it would take away uh it, it would basically bring people and make in, in, into the consumer class rather than just servicing debt uh you don't know how many people i know that are professionals that make 75 eighty thousand dollars a year and they're making 600 dollars a month payments to student loans and they're going to be doing that for 20 years um, they should be making $600 a month payments on their mortgages, fixing their uh, expenses and using that other $600 either to save for retirement or to go out and buy stuff and stimulate our economy. Instead, it's going to serve as debt to the federal government for something that state government should have paid anyway. Right. So that's my opinion on that. Um, and if almost every opinion counter to that has been, it's not fair or uh, I pay for it. So should they. Uh, that's a really selfish way of looking at things just because I suffered, they should too. When really it's people my age and my boomer parents uh, who voted for politicians at the state level that decreased funding to universities, uh, the availability of student loan debt made, uh, and, and the Federal Reserve has actually done a correlational study on this, that the availability of student debt and decreasing state funding is what caused the increase in, uh, in tuition. And now we have hundreds of, you know, or tens of millions of people who owe lots of money who are never going to get out from under it. And so I'm, I'm very concerned with uh, those people. I want them to be full participants in our, uh, uh, yeah. Patrick Mulligan says, how many university courses are a waste of time? Patrick, uh, do you live in Ireland? Uh, some of them for sure are seen as a waste of time. Um, but I don't, I think most of them actually, I, I think that the, the correct lessons from them aren't gleaned. Um, so one of my degrees is in anthropological archaeology where I could have, you could have said that a lot of the courses that I was forced to take were useless and how much did they add to my degree? Uh, they didn't necessarily add that much to my degree, but they form a large basis of the way that I look at the world now. Uh, I was exposed to so many different things uh, in my experience, which hadn't been that limited before. Was certain, my experience is certainly broader afterwards, especially looking at how systems form and um, what things are biologically determined and what things form uh, as a basis of, of uh, cultural determination. Uh, I think that was one of the things that opened my eyes up the most. And and I, I think that's enriched my life immeasurably in terms of understanding. Uh, so I have a little bit of uh, trouble with social issues and, and things like that. And I don't really understand emotional reactions and things like that. So I tend to look at things analytically at all times. I realize not everyone is like me. So yeah. Um, so let's see here. Nugent L says, what would make people in the future? Oh, I, I'm sorry. For some reason, your comments not coming up. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to answer this very, very succinctly. What would make people in the future borrow money and might not pay? Why people pay their debt? Uh, why people who are not slave drivers have to pay offsprings of great grandchildren, former slaves? Yeah, I'm not going to answer that question. Um, 
it's a dumb question. And I'm usually why people who are not slave drivers have to pay offsprings of great, great grandchildren of former slaves. Um, dumb question, dude, unsubscribe, get out. Um, okay. Tertiary education is free in Germany. Um, yeah. And this is why, uh, so go onto the internet or go onto YouTube, go onto the internet. I feel really old today. Go onto YouTube and, uh, just look up the dumbest things an American has said to me. It's, it's stunning. It's actually stunning. And the weird thing is half of the people on there making the comments are actually Americans. And, uh, you know, I can go to Germany and have a basic conversation with just about anyone about geography, economy, or anything inside of the United government inside of the United States. And your average factory worker in Germany is going to be educated enough to have and hold a conversation with me about politics in my own country. Um, like I, I met a weirdest thing. I met a Palestinian cab driver once and I told him where I lived and he knew who my representative was. I didn't know who my representative was. And he told me to lobby this person to get more funding for you know the camp that his family lived in, in Lebanon. Um, and the weirdest thing is, is uh, I was inspired and wrote a letter to my congressman at that point, who I didn't even know who it was until this cab driver told me. And uh, this was a, a Palestinian cab driver. In fact, it was in Germany uh, who did that. So, um, yeah. Have you done any research into uh, P Lab and their advancements? Have you done any research on P Lab and their advancements in lithography and photo masking? No, I have not. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, Patrick Mulligan says, yep, I live in Ireland and a lot of the arts courses will never secure the student a job. Now that's, that's true. That's fair. That's fair. I'm never going to secure the job. They, they, the, the, the enrich your life, but they're never going to secure you, secure you a job. Like, I honestly think that um, in the United States, if you want to study a, you know, like, like math, science, you know, um, certain fields in technology, what I think there are a lot of those degrees where if you have a, a certain grade point average, not even that high, it's a certain grade point average. And you are, a, you, you want to study one of those subjects, man, you bet your education should be free. You should not only that, like if you live in Belgium or in France, you get like stipends to help pay for housing when you go to school um, because they want an educated population that can navigate a, uh, you know, in the world of technology. Many, if you go to Silicon Valley, like many of the people working in Silicon Valley um, they're not from the United States. We've, 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 we've attracted them or capitalism has attracted them from all over the world to work. And, um, I, I want us to be educated enough to fill all of those jobs. And, and we are not, our country is not producing enough educated people at this point that, that needs to change. So, um, yeah. So stocks are falling. Is the economy too strong? This is the, the, the article that I was talking about. Stocks are falling because it's now certain that the uh, Fed is going to take action here. And um, meaning that they're probably still going to do that half point raise this month and next month. And that uh, quantitative tightening is happening. That's how good news can affect the market and have a bad market uh, today. But you know, I, I understand that the, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit today, but I understand that the student loan thing could be controversial. And I never got to what I was talking about with SoFi with this. Um, I think SoFi has already priced into their entire calculation that uh, student loans are going to be pretty much forgiven forever and all of them. Um, and I think it's smart of them to move forward on the assumption that uh, that they, yeah, I think it's smart enough to, 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 to move on the assumption that that's going to happen, even though it's probably not going to happen, that all student debt is going to be forgiven. But I think it's smart enough. You're smart to move on that decision because they need to concentrate on developing their other lines of business anyway. Their their lending arm through their bank charter, their deposit operations through the bank charter, their technology arm, and their financial services arm. So, um, yeah. Uh, Edward Gilmartin says university in Ireland is free, but only the top twenty percent of students get to go. Yeah, this isn't the direction that I expected this live stream to go uh, today. So in France, they have the baccalaureate, which is like a test that you take. And um, and in Belgium, they didn't have that. Uh, and and this, the argument was, is, you know, somebody that went to a rural school or something like that may not have gotten the better education. And it was better to let as many people into the university as possible, as long as they had good grades, even if they couldn't necessarily pass a standardized test and then sort of winnow them out at university. 
um, which makes university in, uh, I, I think proportionally in terms of spending on students, it's probably a lot higher in Belgium than it is in France in that case, because France has that way of, of weeding out people that are not likely to, uh, to finish. But then I look at the experience of the people that I know that have gone to university in Japan, where they studied so hard to get into university so hard to get in there. But by the time they got there, everyone's going to pass. Very few people are not going to finish university in Japan. It's easy compared to what they had to go through to, to get there. I don't have the answers for this, uh, but I'm pointing out that there's a problem. The way we've set up and when we have people in this country now because of debt that are actively discouraging really smart kids not to go to college. And I, I heard this from a couple of people uh, recently that I've spoken to that, man, their children are smart as a whip. And uh, they can do whatever they want and they're interested in science and their parents are actively encouraging them not to go to uni university. I think that this is a mistake. Um, I think this is a giant mistake. If you, if you want, if you're actively in, 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 interested in science and it's something that you want to do, you should definitely go to university. There's nothing wrong with being a plumber. Plumbers make good money. I know plumbers that make just working for people that make six figures a year, but um, we need more scientists. We need more doctors. We need uh, more engineers. We need more coders. We need we need people that are educated and able to operate in a future society, not the society of the past. And that's something that we're missing um, in, in a lot of places. Europe has done a far better job, and a uh, far better job is particularly places like Finland and uh, Denmark. And uh, well, I don't, I don't know about Holland anymore, but definitely Finland and Denmark have done a really good job at creating a competitive economy in the world with a small population with zero military power, just based on, on essentially having an educated population that's good at trade, good at manufacturing. Um, and, and, and actually it's really good at trade is one of the, is one of the great things you're at, but Denmark and Helsinki are, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Denmark and Finland are kind of my two examples right now of how, an education system is supposed to work for uh, the public. Uh, but yeah, and not necessarily France, by the way, or, or Belgium, um, although they're not terrible either. Uh, it's a, a couple of things that don't, that, 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 that don't happen there that happen here all the time. Well, school shootings is one of them, but the other one is something like uh, medical bankruptcy doesn't exist in, in France or Germany or Belgium or places like that. Another huge issue that we have that we, we aren't going to be able to solve. I'm hoping that technology is going to solve some of these problems. You know, this vision of the future that NVIDIA has may be something that, that drastically lowers the cost of medical care, drastically lowers it. And that's something that I'm, I'm really hoping, hoping for. But uh, yeah, happy to talk. I hope I didn't scare anyone off by telling that um, one guy to uh, leave. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to, I didn't delete his comment, but I'm going to delete his comment, uh, uncalled for, uh, but yeah, but ask any questions you'd like, I'll be happy to answer any of them as long as they're not incredibly dumb ones like that one guy had on there. And, um, yeah, I, I was, he had asked some good questions in the past and I was happy to answer that one and tell us all the content of the question or the comment, which I thought was enormously uh, this is coming from someone I have struggle with empathy issues too. And, and this was, this was a remarkably unempathetic question or unempathetic comment. So um, interesting oil prices rise as OPEC considers suspending Russia from output deal. This is uh, news and barons right now. So if you guys didn't know, uh, basically I use uh, all of the income from my Patreon to pay for access to premium news sources and things like that. Uh, my Patreon is not that large, uh, just a, a, you know, a, a couple dozen members in it. But uh, oil prices, it's higher today after briefly falling back on Tuesday, following a report that some OPEC members are exploring the idea of exempting Russia from an agreement to raise oil production targets. Russia has struggled to keep up with output quotas amid sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine. If Russia is exempted, other exporters such as Saudi Arabia would be able to increase production even more to make up for the Russian sort of shortfall. Um, this could be, if you're not familiar with what's happened to uh, oil production in the world, and it's been one of the things that's kind of spurred inflation ever since the 1973-74 uh, war, or 1973 war, Yom Kippur War in Israel, um, where 
OPEC got together and decided to punish the West for supporting Israel and with the full support of the Soviet Union. And that caused a long-term uh, price shock. Uh, but in response you know, to the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, the United States imposed uh, sanctions on Iran, uh, where we prevented them from importing a lot of what they would need to uh, maintain their oil industry. And their production has fallen pretty rapidly or has fallen and has never really recovered. It should be, they should be producing a lot more. We did the same thing to Venezuela. Um, and now their, their oil production industry is in shambles. And this is not good for a stable market in the long term. Uh, and, and Russia, like we have to bleed them of their supply of cash right now. But it could be that their oil industry ends up being severely damaged. And they have different environmental conditions uh, as well. This is uh, a lot of their oil comes out of Siberia. And this is an extremely cold place. And once the well shuts down, if it's the wintertime, you're, ne- you're not getting it started back up until spring. It just ain't happening. Um, so I- I'm actually kind of concerned by this news more than anything else. I would actually rather see them producing oil and have it hit the black market. At, at a much uh, at, at a worse price point for them, so they're they're maybe losing oil, money on the deal or just making a lot less on it, and uh, I'd rather see them do that than um, than totally crushing them in this. Like I'd rather see them not make their obligation and, and face sanction later on for that. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, I, like I said, I made this prediction a couple of times earlier this year that I think that uh, supply chain issues are going to get ironed out. But I also think that the price of fuel by the end of summer could be, or price of oil by the end of summer could be as high as uh, as $150 a barrel. Uh, so Jamie Dimon, let's talk about what he said a minute, uh, in just a minute. And, and these are a lot of the concerns that I have. The economic numbers that came out today actually looked pretty good in terms of manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing base. But there's a lot going on, right? Uh, Jamie Diamond was moderately cautious in the economy. He saw storm clouds ahead and he's bracing for a potential hurricane. Um, but he stuck somewhat of an optimistic tone. And I think when the market digested what he was seeing, uh, it was taken kind of negatively. Uh, there are big storm clouds here right now. It's kind of sunny. Things are doing fine. Everyone thinks the Fed can handle this. The hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Standy or Andrew or something like that. You got to brace yourself. Despite the Dow warning, Diamond said the banking industry is in great shape and equipped to handle the current credit cycle. You have to separate the hurricane from running the business day to day. Um, and let's talk about those pressures going forward. It's it's continued supply chain issues. It's the tightening environment that we're going to face. It's the fact that the Fed doesn't really care at this point if the uh, if the economy slows down due to its actions. It just doesn't want to see it crash completely. He wants to slow it down to reduce inflationary pressures. Um, the Fed is top of his mind. Jamie Dimon's mind is the central bank begins to unwind its bond buying program this month and to reverse the excesses of unprecedented easel, easy fiscal and monetary policies that kept the economy afloat during the pandemic. So one of the things we didn't even talk about uh, recently was the fact that government spending uh, as of this, as from March of last year to now has decreased by 20% from the year before. It was something like $1.4 trillion in pandemic spending that ended at the end of March. We did not make again, right? And the whole idea that the Build Back Better bill was passed and we spent $1.7 trillion and that contributed to inflation, that money has not been spent yet. Most of those programs haven't even started. Um, That was $1.7 or $1.9 trillion over a 10-year period. So um, that that's incorrect. And that's just po- people playing politics. Um, but one of the things dragging on the economy was the is the fact that we don't have the enormous stimulus that we had in 2020. And the government has spent about 20% less uh, in terms of uh, dollars. They need to spend a lot less. So uh, yeah, let me see here. Did you see that ex-bung deliveries in May up 12.5% versus April and 7.78% versus May? Uh, yeah, I did see. And, and it's encouraging. It's encouraging. So their uh, facilities, manufacturing facilities they have in, in Guangzhou and one other province, and they were not quite as affected as much by lockdowns. That was mainly Shanghai. Uh, Guangzhou was shut down for a while. Actually, I don't know if it was or not, uh, but they they were not as affected by that because uh, number one, the they don't sell as many vehicles up north. Neo sells most of their vehicles up up, up north, and Xpong sells most of their vehicles down south. Uh, 
so a lot of people in northern China have not even they've never even heard of Xpeng. Everyone has heard of Neo, but uh, Xpeng is definitely more popular in the south. There's a definite regional difference there. Uh, but their uh, their their deliveries were up, and they're about half of what their total capacity is right now. So very very encouraging though, and I expect those numbers to get better. Based on the timing of reporting though, I think that that um, the numbers for uh, Tesla are not going to look great. They are just simply not going to look great. So, um, yeah, let me know what you guys think. Let me see here. Jason, do you think the boom subscription models based around software as a service will continue? Or they reach a point where finding new customers is super hard and they reach a price cap that users will pay? Well, they're all going to reach a point where finding new customers is super hard and they reach a price cap that, that users are willing to pay. They're going to have to change what they offer to customers in order to get them to, to, to spend more. They're going to have to find ways to make that uh, more useful. But yeah, there is a boom in software as a uh, as a as a subscription models uh, out there. It's really freaking annoying. You can't just buy software now and then not have to pay for it again until you you want to update it. You have to pay on a monthly basis. It's making everything more expensive and, and basically everything that I do. But it does provide really stable revenue for companies. So um, it was at, um, actually Omniverse just changed their software as a subscription mo subscription model to from uh, billing hourly to billing uh, by the second, which actually caused the numbers for Omniverse to look uh, uh, a little bit worse than they actually are because it made it a little bit cheaper. But overall, I think NVIDIA thinks it's going to encourage more use of their platform. But Splunk actually took a huge beating when they switched from a licensing model to a subscription model and it's going to take, and they said up front, it's going to take years for their revenues to backfill on this. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that it's not as widespread right now as we're thinking, but most software companies are going to go to the SAAS model. I think that uh, just like it used to be with gyms where it used to be really hard to get out of a contract and switch, it's going to get easier to get out of contracts and switch. And we're going to see quite a bit of destructive competition. We're going to see acquisitions in software companies, and we're going to see um, uh, we're going to see some companies go out of business. But yeah, I, I do see total price caps, people hit, hitting their head up against that limit over and over and over when it comes to total price caps. I really do. That that's going to happen at some point. Uh, anyway, folks, my voice is getting a little bit tired today, uh, a little bit longer live stream today than than normal usually on for about an hour. Happy to answer any questions. I So I'm probably not going to do any more live streams this week. I'm going to be traveling later on this week. and uh, But I have some videos planned out all for all next week. I may do some live streams next week, but even if I don't, I have videos coming out. And uh, anyway, thank you very much for uh, coming to the live stream today. And uh, I will see you folks next time.